our culture has a definition and a belief about love. And what I would like for us to try to do today is to, and maybe we, we have this to, us, to some extent, but to try to develop a contrast between what the Bible teaches about love and how we are as believers are to love as compared to the way that our culture sees it. Uh, took my wife out uh, on Valentine's Day like I traditionally do if I'm able to and if she's able to we went to see Winter's Tale at the Grand Marquis that's here at the in Ozark at the B&B they have this kind of dinner theater thing and it was pretty cool it was the first time we'd ever done that and, uh, and uh, we went and saw <clears throat> this uh, movie and it was really interesting I was just kind of sitting there with this message that I knew was coming today in the back of my mind just kind of analyzing these basic cultural beliefs um, that are perpetuated through most of the music that we listen to on the radio, secular music uh, that is, and uh, secular movies that uh, show love one way. And while there's some similarities between true love and that kind of love, uh, there's a lot of differences. And so let's take some time and, and look at those. Uh, of course, the movie clip that we <clears throat> just saw, that was from Back to the Future in the 1980s. Uh, so hopefully, you know, if you, you see, I don't, well, I don't know if I should say hopefully you've seen it, but at least uh, hopefully you have some cultural context, maybe, would be the way to say that uh, with that show. Of course, uh, classic kind of love story, kind of comedy, sci-fi comedy about uh, McFly. Uh, see, what's his first name? Uh, Marty. Mar Marty, thank you. Yeah, I couldn't think of it. It's a, it's a name you don't hear a lot anymore. Marty, yeah. Goes back in time, you know, sees his parents, and, and it's just this kind of cool sci fi time paradox thing, you know, going back to change the future in the past. But it's interesting to me that um, among all of these views of love, there's kind of this thinking that love is weak. That it makes us weak, it makes us lose control, it makes us do things we wouldn't normally do. Uh, it's something that takes us out of control. It's something that uh, whisks us away to this imaginary world. And while that's not all bad, I think love, as defined in the Bible, is actually a strength. It's something that uh, we are in control of, something that we choose to do rather than something that we feel or experience. And so let's take a look starting uh, in Matthew chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, I think Thomas is going to help you out by putting it up on the screen. Uh, beginning in verse 43, I think we have really one of the the greatest strengths of love here, and let's read this together. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? So be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. All right, so I think a fascinating set of verses here. Of course, the, the most in-your-face part of that is, is when very clearly and very abruptly at the beginning, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. And that's hard to do. It's easy to love people that are nice to us, that are easy to get along with, that see things the way we do. But to love people that see the world differently, whose values are diametrically opposed to ours, that's really hard. It's really difficult. And it takes a strength and a power that is beyond us. Something that is more than what we have in our mind, um, in our emotional repertoire, it's something that comes from God, who, who is love. He is the, the foundation, the very essence, the very being of love. And so I think when we talk about love, we have to see it not as weakness, but as strength. That when we choose to love, when we choose to yield, when someone's up in our face and, and giving us grief, I'm not saying we compromise what we believe, but when we choose to yield, to love them, just like the, what was being commanded here, that, that the Jews would carry Roman soldiers' uh, armor extra, is uh, extra time. And we've talked about that before, so I won't elaborate on it. But to do things that, for their enemies that are just unthinkable, just the ultimate insult, 
Yet that's how Jesus taught us to live, to turn the other cheek, to care about and people more than we care about ourselves and their needs, the things that, that they desire, the things that they want. And I think it's fascinating because even in the church, how many times do you hear these kind of things? Well, you know, I wish that, I wish that we could, I guess now in a lot of churches they don't have this, but I wish they would make this kind of food. Or I wish that the worship team would sing this song, or this type of songs, or, you know, I wish the music could be louder, or I wish the music could be quieter, or I wish, you know, we have all these things that we want. You know, I wish we could uh, go on this mission trip versus that mission trip. Because we're, we're naturally selfish, aren't we? We are naturally weak. We naturally desire to do the things that we want. And so that love doesn't really come from us. What comes from us is selfishness and anger and hatred. And the Bible says that there's not a single one of us that's righteous. And that even on our best day, our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. And so we have to look to Him to gain that strength that we lack and to make those choices that are so very hard and boy I tell you I, I, I have made this a goal to serve God faithfully in this and I find myself constantly failing because I think about myself and what I want and what I need and I forget about the needs of others and rather than take God's strength and make the hard choices I choose weakness I choose compromise that's not how God's taught us to be. All right, we got any kids here today? Oh, we do. All right, come on up. If we got some young folks, let's come up and have a little chat, have a little children's message here. So, did you guys get your moms anything or your sisters anything for Valentine's Day? Mm -hmm. You did? Okay, what are some of the things you got them? Izzy? Okay, all right, so some candy and some valentines, all right, what else? Anybody give flowers? Anybody's mom get some flowers? Uh, my mom gave me flowers. Okay, all right, good. Ben? My dad gave me flowers. Your dad gave your mom flowers, all right, that's good. Yeah, uh-huh. My dad gave me flowers. Your dad gave your mom flowers, that's very nice. Yeah, yeah, your parents had an anniversary this last week, didn't they? Yeah, that's exciting. So that's something that we do when we love somebody, isn't it? We send them a gift, just something to let them know that we're thinking about them. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? So what's, what's a way that God shows us that He loves us? <coughs> Anybody know? Yeah. yeah? It's okay, you think about it. Justice, do you have one? Yeah. Okay, by creating us, good. All right, what's some other ways that God shows us that? Yeah? Died on the cross for us. Good. Yeah? Things that we can do. Okay. All right. That's okay. Maybe it'll come back to you in a minute. Do you think of yours? Earth. Earth? All right. He listens to all of our prayers. Okay. He listens to our prayers. Good. He shows mercy to us. Yeah, and let's talk about that point for just a minute. You know, what I think is really neat, and I'm going to read a verse to you guys here, is the way that God always puts us first. And in fact, in 1 John 4.20 it says, But God showed His love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, He died for us. And in Romans 5.8 it says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You know, I think we should remember that whenever we want to express love. You know, there's good ways and bad ways to express love, isn't there? You know, if we're, sometimes we can selfishly take things we think that we love and maybe we don't, we're just being selfish. But then when we give of ourselves and we honestly think of other people, then we're giving and we're loving like God, aren't we? All right, let's pray about that, and let's ask God to give us strength to do that in the, in the days and the weeks to come. God, thank you for today. Thank you for each of these children. God, we thank you for a holiday where we can talk about the essence of who you are and the actions that you have made for us. 
and the love that you have for us through your Son coming and dying on the cross for our sins. Would you help us to show that same love to the people that are around us, even if they're people that are mean to us or people we don't like? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, guys. You can go sit back down. Thanks for coming up and hanging out with me for a little bit today. First Corinthians 12, I'm sorry, th actually it uh, should be 13, I've got it written wrong in my notes, but I think it's, Thomas has got it correct on the slides there. Talks about gifts, and it talks about the priority of those gifts in the context of love. Let's, read, let's just read this chapter, it's just a, a great chapter together. If I speak the languages of men and of angels... But I don't have love. I'm, I'm a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all of my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but don't have love, I gain nothing. Because love is patient, it's kind, it does not envy, it's not boastful, it's not conceited, it's not acting properly, it's not selfish, it's not provoked, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs, it finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. You know, I think it's interesting that it says that even knowledge will come to an end. And that's hard for me to believe, because when I think about all the things that there is to know, it, it seems unending. You know, I mean, even just, I mean, if you just took, looked at a, a sample college curriculum or high school curriculum, you know, just to know all of that stuff, it would be very difficult for one person to, eat, to grasp that. And then you have this whole world of things that we don't know, all the things outside of our small planet that we don't understand. And to imagine that even that will have an end, and yet love is even greater than that. And that teaches me something. That teaches me that there is something that eludes us as mortal beings. I don't think we understand the power and the strength and the greatness and the challenge of grasping this one truth. I mean, the Bible <clears throat> even says that God is love. And so what do we know about God? We know that He's all-powerful. We know that He's all-knowing. I mean, He, you know, back to the future for Him would be no problem because He sees all time simultaneously. He perceives it. He understands it. He knows what's going to happen. He can remember what has happened. I mean, I can't even remember the past, my own past that I've experienced. Yet God can see and know all of that. And somehow all of that knowledge, all of that wisdom, all of that understanding is encapsulated inside of this concept of love. And I think we've kind of dumbed it down. We've made it something silly and simple in our culture is we focused on just a few aspects of it. And the Bible talks about love in three ways. There's three Greek words for love. Eros and agape and phileo, different types of love. We tend to kind of focus on that eros love. You know, if you turn on the secular radio, I mean, what's about 80% of the songs about? You know, getting that girl or that guy. You know, there's usually some beer drinking involved and other, you know, fast driving and, and other such activities. And so there's this selfish aspect where we're wanting them to do something for us, to make us feel a certain way, or we're trying to manipulate them. Listen to a lot of songs about all these things that people try to, to find love, to gain love, or we watch movies 
where people search and they do all these things and memorize all these pickup lines. You know, it's fascinating to me that we're really all grasping, we're all looking for the same thing. But many of us, we don't even understand what we're really looking for. We know that there's some kind of hole, there's some kind of void inside of us that we desire and we long and we yearn for something to make that go away, to satisfy that desire, to make us feel fulfilled. But how do we know where to look for that? How do we know how to make that nagging, empty feeling go away? See, the answer to that question is truth. Truth does that through God's Word. And that's why it is so important for us. You know, holidays are just a great way uh, for me to, to grasp something that's happening in our culture and to, to take the truth that I know and to use it to have influence in people's lives. Uh, you know, I think last year somebody said, well, how is it that we do so many outreaches on holidays? You know, we have our 4th of July thing, we have Halloween, you know. And I think it's because that's the, that's the one time of year where, as a culture, we have these traditions, these things that we do together. And as we're celebrating those things, and as we're spending the time together celebrating Independence Day or, or uh, Valentine's Day or you know, April Fool's Day or whatever it is, we can take the, the partial truths that are there in our culture and illuminate the whole truths that are there. And I think that's what we're to do. I mean, Paul talked about uh, in, his, in his letters in the New Testament about him being an ambassador to the to people that were in his culture. I mean, he went everywhere and he he was all kinds of different things. He was the scholar, he was the Jew, uh, he was the one that was beaten and thrown out of the city. Uh, you know, he was all these different things. And, and what did he say? So that I might win some. So we know that there's free will. I mean, everyone has a choice. They can choose to, re to accept the truth that we offer or to reject the truth. And that choice really has nothing to do with us. And I know that's hard because for me, I'm looking for the win. I'm looking for that day, that moment where I can see in their eyes that I've won them over. That that truth of who God is has finally become alive in them. And they make that decision to follow Christ. And we all we love those times and we rejoice in those times when there's baptisms and when there's salvation. But God only asks one thing of us. He asks us to love, to love them. And in doing that, we share God's truth. That's just the outflow of that. That's just the natural reaction to us doing that. I think it's interesting if you look at the end of the first section that we read in Matthew, which comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says something really interesting. It's almost paradoxical. He says, be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, <clears throat> if you're like me, I'm kind of a skeptic uh, a little bit at heart, and so I always... I wonder about these things that I see in Scripture that seem impossible. Because in the one sense, Romans teaches me that I'm a sinner and that, that there's no hope for me unless I become saved. And then when Jesus returns, takes me to heaven, then I become fulfilled. And I get this glorified self that no longer desires sin, no longer desires evil. And so I get to exist with God in heaven, whatever that looks like. And I never have to worry about being selfish and evil again. But in this intermediate time, where we're still plagued by sin, how is it that we can be perfect? And as I've really thought about this and pondered that, it kind of hit me like a brick over the last few weeks. It is through God's act of love towards us that we are made perfect. Have you ever thought about that? That He, he makes up the difference. You know, it's kind of like we're, we're all fractions. You know, we're either a fourth or a third or three fourths or five eighths or we're eleven sixteenths. Sorry, that's a woodworking uh, measurement. A lot of times when you buy lumber that's been milled on one side, it comes at eleven sixteenths. But I know that's kind of a, a useless measurement for about everybody else. But we're a fraction. We're some part of that whole fulfilled self that we know will become one day when we go to be with Jesus in heaven. But yet, He makes up that other fraction to make us whole, to make us right. It's His righteousness. It's God's righteousness 
that bridges the gap for us. And it's in that that we're made perfect. So what is a picture then in the scriptures that we can look at that takes this contrast of love as a strength and, and it's a power of God's that we are to use and to, to be faithful, to move forward and to, to, to act it out, to live it out in our lives, in the people around us, to our, to our friends, to our spouse, to all the people that are in our, in our world, even our enemies, Jesus says. And as I'm thinking about it, I, I thought about last week when we watched a little clip from Prince of Egypt. I thought about Moses and Miriam. And I thought about how amazing Miriam's love for her husband, Moses, was that she was willing to go with him to free the slaves in Egypt. And I think about this for just a minute. Let's just kind of go back. And, and if you're not familiar with this, the whole story, that's okay. I'll try to fill in the, the parts that are important for, for you to know. But in Exodus 2, chapter 2, and then in Exodus chapter 4, we have the story of the Israelites' exodus. That's why the book's called Exodus. That just means to exit, to leave, to depart from, from slavery. All right? So you remember that um, Joseph was, uh, you know, and you, you know that would be a great story for us to share one day. Joseph was the guy that uh, was thrown in prison falsely. He, his brothers threw him in a pit. Uh, just because his father loved him and gave him this, this nice coat and he lived, suffered in a difficult life. But in the end, he was able to save his whole nation. God used him in a great way. And his family was fruitful and they multiplied and they became so numerous that the Egyptians were frightened that their culture was going to be overrun by the Hebrews and so they made them slaves. This happened over a long period of time. And Moses uh, was actually a Jewish boy that was dropped in the river and kind of left, you know, for dead. But fortunately, uh, one of the princesses in Egypt found him and took him into their house. And as he got older, he realized that uh, he really wasn't one of them, them being the Egyptians. And he actually got mad one day when he saw an Egyptian beating a Jew, and so he killed him. And then he fled off to Midian which was a kind of a foreign land. But that's where he met uh, a priest who he became friends with and worked for and then uh, he gave him his daughter, Miriam, and that's how they met and got married. And then God tells Moses, you know, appears to him in the burning bush and he says, you need to go back to Egypt and I'm going to use you to free my people. That are, have become slaves in Egypt. So I know that was kind of the quick, quick version, and you may not have followed all that, and that's okay. You know, you can read all of that as John encouraged you to do, and I would also encourage you. It's just a great uh, book. Uh, it goes all the way through chapter 18, and even into Numbers 12, is still talking about this great delivery of God's people. And I think it's important for us because the same thing is it is happening. To us right now. I mean, as I mean, our, our friends that are not believers, they are slaves. They are slaves to sin. They are slaves to the enemy. And until they are freed by truth, by love, they will remain slaves and they will perish as slaves. And so, in a lot of ways, we're like Moses because we are going back to them. Whether they're at work, whether they're in our families, wherever they are, we're going back to them to free them because God has sent us, hasn't He? I mean, He's commanded us to do this, just like He commanded Moses. So I think this is just a great story. It really parallels for all of us how we're to live. And so here's Miriam who, first of all, she is the first time he, he goes back to Egypt by himself. So she's a, a, raising all the kids by herself alone. And then Moses comes back and he says, and actually uh, I wrote this down because I, I thought this was really fascinating. In Exodus 4, verse 20, the first half of the verse, it says, So Moses took his wife and his sons, put them on a donkey, and went back to the land of Egypt. All right, see, so you don't get just a, a, a nice full narrative of how that all went down. Um, in my household, it would probably go something like this. Uh, Stephanie, God told me that I'm supposed to do this, so get on a donkey and we're going to go for a two-month journey. She would look at me and say, 
uh, not so fast. Give me some more information, all right? And into which we would have a dialogue uh, back and forth, and who knows what that would look like. But I mean, imagine that. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you're going to leave your people everything you've ever known, all right? That'd be like for some of us, like moving to Ukraine, perhaps. God's called us to go there and do something, plant a church, I don't know what. And so we're going to, you know, fortunately, we don't have to get on donkeys, I guess, uh, so it could be a lot worse. But we're going to just leave everything, leave our culture, leave everything we know and go there to serve God. And our families are going to go with us. That would be hard. Yet Miriam, you don't, you don't see, you know, Miriam pitched a fit and wouldn't go. Apparently she just got all the kids on the donkeys and they headed out to Egypt. All right? I mean, I'm sure that was a pretty difficult time to leave her family. You know, they lived in, her, in their father's house, which is typical in that day and age. And so they kind of headed out into this hostile territory. But what a great story, what a great love story for us to, to look at that. Because it has all of the elements that we talked about. It has strength, it has challenge, it, it has the fulfillment of God's calling on our life. It has choice. It's not selfish, it's not envious, just, it's not all the things that was talked about when we read in 1 Corinthians 13. It took a lot of humility a lot of humbleness to accept God's calling to be faithful in that. So I'm not going to go long today. <clears throat> I know we've kind of had a several of us, I won't uh, specify names, but we've kind of ch had a struggle with going preaching really long sermons. So I'm not going to do that to you today. But I don't want us to leave before we really lock in our minds the contrast between that weak, I would almost say pathetic in a way, love that causes us to lose control, that causes us to do selfish things, to reject that and to accept and embrace in our lives that truth that God's strength dwells in us when we choose to love. Love is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's not a sensation. It's not a mysterious irony. It's not fate. It's not any of those things that we so cutely see in a lot of the movies that are on television and in movies. But love happens the day that we gain courage and that we exchange the lie that the enemy has been telling us. We exchange that for truth. And we take that truth and we, we act on it in our lives. And we become that person that, as you look around, we're giving more away than what we're receiving. And that may be a good test for you. You may be sitting there thinking, well, you know, which, which kind of love do I live out in my life? You know, have I embraced this cultural view of love or do I have a biblical view of love? And one way that you can answer that question is to, to, to give yourself that little test. Are you a giver or a taker in your marriage? Are you a giver or a taker in, in your friendships? With the people that you go to school with, people that you work with. Are you a giver or a taker? Do you serve them more or are you served more? And I think that's a great way for us to, to assess ourselves. And you know what? If we've I, I, I can definitely testify that, boy, until I was probably married and maybe then some, I really didn't understand any of that. In fact, I actually read a book that opened my eyes called The Secret of Loving by Josh McDowell, who's a, a writer that he was really famous back in the, in the 80s. Not so much anymore, you don't hear his name very much. But in his book, The Secret of Loving, I mean, that was really the premise of the book, that love is a choice, something that we choose to do. And what's amazing to me <clears throat> that I learned is the feelings follow that. When I make choices to serve my wife and to love her, those feelings come after that. They don't come before. And I think what, what happens is when we get into relationships, we have that eros love that's influencing us and we're kind of googly-eyed and, and, and we're excited because of what they, how they make us feel. When those feelings suddenly go away, if that relationship is all built on that eros love, it just falls apart. Because it's not really built on something solid. It's not built on something strong. It's built on something weak. 
And we all know about weak foundations. They crack and they crumble. Uh, what was that story uh, in the news this last week about the Corvettes or, or some kind of cars that the sinkhole just opened up and they just... <laughs> That's terrible, you know. I mean, what a terrible thing to happen to such nice cars. But that's what it's like. You know, that's a great picture for what it's like to build our life around that weak foundation because it's eventually just going to collapse and we're going to be left lonely and depressed and frustrated and disappointed. But God gives us an alternative. So, Ned, if you'll come up and begin to play, let's just, let's just take some time and go before the Lord and think about these scriptures that we've read. Think about God's His paradigm of love. And begin to, to search and seek out in our life. Where are the places that we're struggling? Where are the places that we, we have failed the people in our lives? Where we have become to be, began to be takers. And we just keep taking and sucking the life out of them rather than giving life. God gave life to us. The only hope that we have is because He provided it for us. He gave us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity in the Old Testament. And as a people, we continually failed every time. We just could not love, we could not be good enough to accomplish God's purposes. And so what did He do? He was the giver. In fact, He gave everything that He had to give. He gave Himself. So that we could have salvation, absolutely. But also so that His love could be reproduced in us. They could be planted and, and born again in us. And then when we become alive, when we begin to live that out and we begin to take that strength, that tough love, and rather to be enablers, to help people continue to sin and to continue to struggle, we sometimes we have to tell them the hard truths that they don't want to hear because that's the way that they're going to get better. Just like anybody that's struggling with alcohol or any kind of addiction, somebody that's just struggling with anger or hate or depression, the only way that we can overcome those things is by truth being spoken into our life and into the lives of people around us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's let Him clean us. Let's let Him mold us and shape us today. Let's pray. God, the task seems overwhelming. To love my enemies. To love people that have a different political view, a different moral view than I have. To love people who discourage me and who hurt my feelings. You don't see things the way that I do. God, that's so hard. To give to people even if they don't deserve it. To love them unconditionally. Wow, God, it seems so difficult. And yet you have told us that you will make us perfect. That you will accomplish every good thing in us if we will just humble ourselves and be faithful. If we will choose to love with a love that, that permeates, that surpasses understanding. So God, today I just hold on to that truth. Just by a thread. Just by a thread. Trusting, Lord, that somehow you will use us as individuals, that you will use us as a church, even in an age of church decline, people are turning away from you. Even in a time when selfishness is choking the life out of people, poverty is rising, people work longer hours, harder hours. And somehow, God, in spite of all that trouble, in spite of all those difficulties, all those reasons just to, to quit, 
to get mad, to walk away. God, I pray that you would give us the strength to trust you, to move forward in boldness, to love with a strong love that is unwavering. It's like a piece of steel. It's like a, a tower of refuge. God, we love you. We just surrender everything, just like we sang a few minutes ago. We surrender all to you today. And would you make us into the people that you want us to be? Would you heal those that are sick? Would you bless those that are away and bring them back to us? But Lord, if we look around and everyone else around us fails, would you help us to be faithful? Thank you guys so much. I hope that uh, you'll take these truths and walk with them this week. I do want to remind you that we will have a brief uh, memorial service tonight uh, for uh, Les Bodley. Uh, it will be at 6.30. It will be right here in this building. Uh, you guys have a blessed afternoon. Talk to you soon.